Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, Creating a Healthy Lifestyle to Boost Your Immune System During the Global COVID-19 Pandemic. My name's Amy Wayne. I'm a part of the marketing team here at Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety, Inc., aka PJRFSI, or just FSI. We're very excited today to be hosting a, a very special guest speaker today. Um, we're hosting Dr. Lee, a New York Times selling best Sorry, a New York Times bestselling author and the leader of the Angiogenesis Foundation. I'll be introducing him to you more in depth later in the presentation, but first let's cover a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, all of our attendees today are on mute to help ensure call clarity, but we do absolutely want to ask your, answer your questions. So if you want to go ahead and use the questions tab on the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel, you can type those questions in and submit them. We'll hold off on responding until the end, but feel free to think of them, I'm sorry, <laughs> feel free to submit them as you think of them. Uh, the biggest question we usually get is regarding slides and recordings. Yes, we do record every webinar and it'll be available from FS, pjrfsi.com or our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for PJRFSI or Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety and our channel should be easy to find. And like I said, the slides will be available for download as well from pjrfsi.com. So these screenshots will just quickly show you where to find that question panel that I mentioned. And you'll just click into the question and answer uh, tab, type it in and send it off and we will address as many as possible at the end of the session. But first, just to get us started, we wanna get an idea of who is on the call today. So we have a quick little poll for you and it has to do with what kind of business are you in? What sort of job do you do out in the world? Are you in manufacturing? Do you work in retail or wholesale, the service sector, finance, maybe farming or food production, or none of the above? So just go ahead and fire in a quick answer. We'll give you a few seconds uh, to get those votes in, and then I'll move on to introducing our first speaker. So it looks like we do have about half of you voting. Thank you so much. Get those last votes in. And I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll. And it looks like we have a lot of manufacturing and service people as well as some unspecified folks. So thanks for responding. We'll have a couple more polling questions throughout the presentation just to get you engaged and see who's on the call and how can we better answer your questions. So our first speaker today is someone from our own uh, family here at PGRFSI, it's Paul DeMarin. He's our Senior Vice President of Food Safety and Supply Chain. Paul joined us at PGRFSI in January of just this year, but Paul has over 35 years of experience in the hospitality, service, and retail agri-food sectors. Before he came to join us at PGRFSI, he worked for 15 years in the certification industry with clients in almost every sector, from food safety and supply chain to brand protection and quality. He's worked for many years in management system certification as well. And before that, Paul was a professional chef and a consultant for over 20 years in major hotel, major hotel chains, restaurants, private golf courses, and food service organizations. So without any further ado, I'm gonna hand things over to Paul. And Paul, you can take it away. Great, thank you very much, uh, Amy. I really appreciate that introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar. I am extremely uh, happy and appreciative for everybody to attend today. We really appreciate your time. Um, I know that we have a very significant large audience with us uh, and again we're, we're completely thrilled about that so thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview because I want the star of our show today to uh, have as much time as possible but just to talk a little bit about our family of companies. Um, just before that though I'd, I'd like to just mention because it's very relevant to our, our topic here today that We've really seen the effects of COVID-19, uh, not only in Canada and the US, but across the world. But at the same time, we've also seen the best in each other uh, between our staff, our clients, our colleagues. So on behalf of PJR FSI, uh, I just want to applaud everybody for doing their part to help us get through this unprecedented time, including everybody on the call today. Your time is important and we appreciate it. So as Amy mentioned, my name is Paul. I'm the SVP for our Food Safety and Supply Chain Division. Um, I have the pleasure of also welcoming Dr. Lee as our feature presenter today. I am uh, very excited to be sharing the stage with Dr. Lee, uh, who will in fact, uh, as we speak later today, about COVID-19 is one of our, um, uh, I'm sorry about that, I just had uh, something else come to my screen here. 
Um, so again, I apologize. Uh, Dr. Lee, he's actually one of the researchers who is actually working on the global COVID-19 pandemic, and he's going to be able to share with us a lot more specific details about that uh, a little bit later, so very excited. So at this point now, I would like to talk uh, a little bit about the timeline here with Perry Johnson. We were originally founded in 1994 by Perry Johnson himself, uh, Perry L. Johnson, and have really been at the forefront of international certification and registration from the very beginning. We achieved our initial ANAB accreditation shortly after uh, PJR's creation in 95. And then our first venture into international business came in uh, 1999 with the expansion into our Japanese and Brazilian markets. Uh, PGLA, or our laboratory accreditation business, was also founded in 99. And in the early 2000s, uh, we grew further overseas and opened offices in Germany, Portugal, uh, Latin America, Thailand, Spain, etc. cetera. Uh, during that time, we also attained our UCAS uh, or UK accreditation. And in more recent years, we did further expansion internationally with offices in the United Kingdom and China. In 2005, PG&A was founded, and that is our healthcare technology company that specializes in transcription, medical coding, telemedicine, and virtual scribing services. Shortly thereafter, FSI or PGR FSI was born as the result of the demand in industry for third-party certification to various food safety and quality standards. We're headquartered in Troy, Michigan. We're truly a global company, however. Um, and a family of companies really that supports registration, testing, and certification to many globally well-known standards around the world. Everything from uh, HACCP certification to organic gluten-free. We do work with social responsibility uh, and even standards representing the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration. So to talk a little bit more about as an organization, we work with retailers, processors, farms, importers and exporters, distribution companies, and we really support them on managing not only their food safety, but their quality, environmental requirements, uh, supply chain uh, risk, as well as brand protection requirements. Nobody wants to be the company that is being, um, you know, marketed uh, on, the, on the website as having significant issues within their supply chain. So we do our best to try and support that. We're currently recognized as the number one registrar in the Americas by the International Association of Accredited Registrars. Um, as Perry Johnson himself did over 30 years ago with our clients, we apply the principles of quality management, uh, collaboration, organizational excellence, and we do that in all of our field and uh, office activities to ensure that we're complying with the requirements that are set forth to us by the international standards organization and accreditation bodies. So currently today, we have about 460 auditors in over 60 countries who work with our clients and understand the local regulations, the language requirements, and equally important, the culture. Uh, for the last five years, we've had a very strong customer uh, satisfaction rating of nine and a half out of 10 as well. So as the slide points out, and again, relevant for our talk here today, the certification industry has been deemed as one of the essential services. But why is that? Because food safety certification or quality certification, environmental certification, these are all based on the results of tests, inspections, and audits. And it gives our, you know, our clients uh, confidence that the organization's products or their systems are being thoroughly evaluated against accepted uh, national and international industry standards by a competent third party like Perry Johnson. But today, this doesn't for us mean that it's business as usual. It's far from it. There are several changes of how our business has been running over the last three or four months. And we do that to ensure that we're providing a high, high quality service for our customers while maintaining safety and doing our part to try and reduce the effects of COVID-19. Uh, you know, I know that I'm speaking on behalf of the whole company. We're not taking this lightly. And today we've used every precaution in our business uh, to try and reduce and eliminate direct physical interaction that could promote the transmission of the virus. We, we are actively promoting social distancing. We follow the recommendation of various health authorities uh, around hand washing and sanitizing. 
We define our services at Perry Johnson into really four key areas. Uh, one is auditing and certification to accredited international standards like ISO 9001 or GFSI for the food safety programs. Uh, we do a lot of second party auditing. Uh, we do customer specific supplier audits as well. And then we follow that up with offering training to our clients on the various standards. To give you uh, a little bit of an overview here, we, we currently support about 30 different programs on the food safety side. There are really many audits that are uh, expected or mandated. Um, a lot of people on the phone here today may not understand this because from a consumer perspective, it's not something that we readily see available, but you know, it's very important that every time we walk into a grocery store, we have products that we're buying uh, from the retailers and from the stores that the retailers are working very hard to ensure that they vet and manage the, 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 the safety of their supply chain so that when it comes to us as the consumer, the food is safe. Um, we have this really broken out into five main areas. We do our first party audits, which are customer specific. So if a retailer has a specific program that they've written and developed and they want us to go audit their suppliers against, we will do that. Um, if we're doing a second party assessment, these are standards that we as a certification body have written and developed. And many times our clients will use those standards because they're, they've already been technically vetted they're recognized around the world, et cetera. Third party assessments are all of the accredited standards. And then finally, we also do a lot of work with the various government audits, um, you know, such as the Food Safety Modernization Act, the Foreign Supplier Verification Program, and, and several others. Now, when we look at the management system or non-food side of the house, 30 years ago is really where this all started with Perry Johnson registrars. This is just a sample of some of the core management standards that really started it all. Uh, we conduct accredited audits across many schemes, uh, including quality, environmental, uh, aerospace, automotive. If you take a look at, you know, every time we buy a car, there are automotive standards that are in play behind the scenes that every one of the manufacturers have to have gone through uh, before it even gets to the point of being sold. And that is the same with any other product or widget that's being sold. These standards have been so critical and key to the development of the food program as well. These are what really started the whole process of international certification. Um, talking about accreditation now, uh, we have longstanding relationship with uh, many recognized accreditation bodies around the world. Um, accreditation gives assurance uh, to our customers that our family of companies operates under the rules of accreditation bodies and helps maintain the highest uh, quality of our work. On many occasions, we actually partner with these groups to host joint webinars or provide up-to-date information to our customers um, so that you have the most uh, relevant and important information that's affecting your business today. So just to kind of high level, typically as a certification body, we go and audit suppliers or manufacturers or processors. The accreditation bodies come and audit us to make sure that we're meeting the necessary uh, requirements of being a audit body for these certifications. So certification really gives uh, you know, customers around the world the confidence that they've partnered with a recognized uh, and respected partner like Perry Johnson. So uh, I've only got a few more here that I wanna talk about. This is as we address the pandemic, we've implemented global procedures and processes when it comes to protecting our clients, our staff and various um, you know, individuals in the communities as well. Many of our clients are contacting us on a regular basis with a variety of situations that can impact their ability to move forward with these global audits that are required. Um, many organizations have, um, you know, uh, operations are reduced or they've completely shut down. Many have no visitor policies. Um, there's restrictions to certain uh, locations while others are still accessible. So the um, accreditation group or GFSI, which is Global Food Safety Initiative, they have implemented temporary procedures for many organizations uh, to address the pandemic. Um, and, you know, to the point of, as an example, they're allowing us to extend certificates for six months. Uh, we're moving forward and having a lot of discussions with respect to uh, virtual audits um, as well and conducting remote audits. But at the end of the day, 
even with all of the policies that we have, the most important thing is for us to protect the safety of our employees uh, and yours. Uh, we're really going through unprecedented change right now. We've never seen this before, uh, you know, in the industry, and we're all facing it. Whether you work for a company or you're not, um, this is directly affecting you. So again, you know, on a daily basis, we're reviewing uh, the valuable public health information from CDC and other bodies to make sure that you have the most up-to-date information. We're partnering with experts like Dr. Lee to bring you timely and relevant content. Um, you know, and uh, really, I think that if even if we do follow these recommendations and policies and procedures that are outlined by groups like the CDC and the FDA and even our own company policies, this still does not prevent the virus from reaching us or our families. So if you're working with Perry Johnson in any way, um, you have our commitment that we're doing everything in our power on our end to keep you safe and, and help to protect your brand. Um, I won't talk a lot about this. This is essentially, you know, all of the different uh, means of virtual and remote audit technology that we're currently using. This really depends a lot on the, you know, connectivity of uh, the customer that we're working with. But right now, everything is moving to virtual and remote uh, assessments because we have to. You know, the industry is changing, it's adjusting, and, um, you know, we're, we're doing that with them as well. So. Just uh, last thing, I just want to uh, kind of just recap here is, you know, as I mentioned, we have over 30 years of experience working with organizations in really every type of industry and sector. Uh, on a daily basis, we're publishing relevant content and information that companies use. And, you know, we really are in a time of great change. It, it was only just a few short months ago that this has all happened and, and began. And, you know, for all of the, the companies and organizations that are on our call today, I still believe we're only at the beginning of this and we all need to start building our plans for recovery post COVID-19. This includes in many cases, a pivot to your business models or operations or your supplier policies, maybe even offboarding strategies, uh, our technologies and, and certainly remobilizing our workforce. This is really a time of monumental change and now is the time for us all to execute and lay out those plans so that you can give not only your customers or your suppliers, but also your stakeholders and employees confidence that you are in control. So I thank you very much for listening to me and uh, I look forward to your questions later. I'm now gonna pass it back to Amy. Great, thanks so much, Paul. It's that time again, everybody. I've got one more polling question coming at you. And this is gonna to have to do with setting up Dr. Lee so he gets an idea of who's on the call and what everybody knows. Um, we would like to know, do you have any idea so far how to boost your immunity through food? Are you very aware? Are you somewhat aware, unsure, or do you have no knowledge on the topic? All of your responses to these polls are anonymous. Nobody can see your name as you vote. So go ahead and give us your feelings and opinions. And as I said at the beginning, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and type those into the questions tab down at the bottom of the GoToWebinar control panel. We will answer as many as we have time for in the uh, end of the presentation. So it looks like we've got a good number of responses. So let's go ahead and close the poll. And it looks like a lot of you already have some idea of how to influence your immunity through what you eat. And that is awesome. But I'm sure Dr. Lee has some more information. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you um, Dr. William Lee. He is a world-renowned physician, scientist, speaker, and the author of Eat to Be Disease. Uh, the new science of how your body can heal itself. He's best known for leading the Angiogenesis Foundation. His groundbreaking work has impacted more than 70 diseases, including cancer, diabetes, blindness, heart disease, and obesity. His TED Talk, Can We Eat to Starve Cancer, has garnered more than 11 million views, and he's appeared on shows such as Good Morning America, CNN, MSNBC, NPR, Voice of America, and in The Atlantic, Time, and The New York Times. As an author of over 100 scientific publications in leading journals such as Science, the New England Journal of Medicine, and The Lancet, Dr. Lee has served on the faculties of the Harvard Medical School, Tufts University, and the Dartmouth Medical School. So it's my great honor to introduce you, Dr. Lee. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand the reins over to him and you can take it away when you're ready, Doctor. Thank, well, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank uh, PJRFSI, uh, Paul and Amy, for inviting me to um, speak. Uh, we are indeed in an unprecedented time, and before I tell you what we're learning from the uh, 
uh, front lines. Um, I'm one of the researchers working on COVID-19 and have some uh, breaking news to be able to share with you. Uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of my uh, my background so that you can um, see where I'm coming from and, and where um, who the speaker is. So I'm actually from uh, the East Coast, but sort of the um, uh, Midwest side of the East Coast from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I trained um, uh, at uh, Harvard um, Medical School uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital is where I got my clinical training. And I'm a scientist, a physician, and an author. And what uh, something that I'm really passionate about doing is uh, trying to uh, find new ways to actually uh, com uh, combat the, um, the the problems of diseases that face us. And so before COVID, I actually have been focusing on how do we beat cancer? How do we beat diabetes? How do we beat um, Alzheimer's? How do we prevent blindness? How do we prevent amputations by healing wounds? And it turns out that really looking at um, how the blood vessels work in the body was a critical common denominator approach. And that led to a number of medical breakthroughs that um, have really helped doctors um, help people keep uh, a good quality of, of life and to avert some of the diseases. But about 10 years ago, I realized you could use the same science for pre prevention of many of those diseases. How do we prevent cancer? How do we actually um, prevent the complications of diabetes? How do we prevent blindness? Um, and, uh, and prevention doesn't lend itself well to medicines. Um, medicines take a while to develop and they're expensive and you need a doctor's prescription. And so I began asking what can we actually do uh, using good science to be able to prevent disease uh, and that involved food. And that brought food to the forefront uh, and I was able to study foods using the same types of technologies, uh, advanced testing that we used um, uh, to develop drugs. So if you've heard of the frame phrase, food as medicine, this is something that I've been working on, but literally trying to compare foods and medicines together to figure out how they, um, uh, how they compare, how do they work together, what do foods actually do in the body. And so I wrote a book um, uh, called The Eat to Beat Disease, uh, the new science of how your body can heal itself um, became a New York Times bestseller because really this is a topic that people really want to know. Um, uh, and and my, my punchline on this is that when it comes to food and health, it's not just about the food. It's really about how your body responds to what you put inside it. And your body can actually use um, defense systems that were hardwired with when we're born in order to be able to resist diseases and some of those defenses include the immune system and some of those diseases include viruses. So although I talked about cancer and heart disease and diabetes, let's really focus on um, uh, in, uh, on viruses because you know this book came out last March and uh, and we were this was a, you know really a year before COVID. And then just a few weeks ago, uh, COVID really took the world by surprise. I call it the cough that took a civilization, a whole civilization down to its knees. And we're just starting to get back, you know, kind of get back on our feet again to try to figure out what are we gonna do about this? Uh, so um, what I thought I would do is talk to you about what do we know about health in the COVID era? And what are we actually thinking about uh, uh, in terms of understanding the disease and from our understanding, what do we do to actually um, uh, combat it? So rather than only running away and hiding and sheltering, which is the logical response we've been doing, now how do we fight back? How do we actually take control and do something for ourselves? And this is where the theme of what we're talking about, you know, how do you create a healthy lifestyle um, by boosting your immunity in this um, COVID-19 pandemic? That's really what I wanna kind of um, tell you about. So first, uh, let me tell you that health our health is not the absence of disease. It's the presence of our uh, health defense systems working at firing in our bodies and all cylinders from the time we're born to our very last breath. What are these health defense systems? There are circulation, we need good blood flow. There are stem cells, believe it or not, humans regenerate continuously is what research is showing us from the inside out. We don't do it very quickly, but we do it enough to actually heal ourselves from the inside. And foods can influence that. Um, our microbiome, everybody's heard about good, healthy gut bacteria. Very important, some breaking news, um, really um, research that I've been reviewing, showing that our gut 
how happy our gut bacteria is may influence our defense systems, which may help us resist um, uh, COVID. Um, our DNA, is, uh, which is another defense, is not just a, um, uh, a genetic code, but actually prevents us from being insulted by the, and destroyed by the environment. And finally, our immunity, which every grandmother told us uh, was important, but now we know is more important than ever before because we need to actually avoid being infected by COVID. So let me tell you um, uh, what I'm doing in COVID research because not, uh, not many people have heard about this just yet. Um, uh, I've organized a international team of researchers uh, to actually look at what is happening in the body when the virus in invades. Um, the tissue. So here's what we've been able to put together so far, and this is a um, really kind of a moving um, area of uh, this is the story is, is the story is coming out as we go along. Uh, first, um, uh, COVID-19 is a respiratory virus, and it comes from a kind of uh, virus called the coronavirus. Coronavirus has actually caused a cold. So when you hear somebody say that COVID-19 is like a bad flu. Um, it's not true because influenza is caused by flu is called, caused by the influenza virus. Uh, uh, COVID-19 is caused by the coronavirus. So not even related um, uh, COVID-19 and, and the flu. Um, let's talk about what what the, what this respiratory virus does. We breathe it in, and it goes into our nose, um, which is why it's so important to cover our face um, uh, these days to protect ourselves and uh, the virus kind of gets into the mucus which is what you would blow your nose into a into a, uh, uh, a tissue uh, if you had a cold uh, that's kind of getting rid of virus when you have a cold uh, but the virus will actually um, uh, be killed in your nose by your antibodies your natural antibodies your immune system if you've got a really good strong immune system think about that as like the front gate um, uh, of, of a of your of your home that prevents burglars from actually coming in so that's why a strong immunity becomes really important right from the time that you might accidentally breathe in some of this um, uh, virus. And this is true not just for COVID-19, but any virus. The, the, the battle can be fought right there and won, and you might get a cold, you might not get very sick. Um, but if the virus actually sneaks past your nose, and we've all heard that this virus actually causes people to lose their sense of smell, we think that's actually sh um, reflecting the period when the virus is going past your nose and, and into your system. It'll go from your nose down to your lungs. So think about when you actually choke on, uh, on, on a drink of water. That's like water getting into your lungs. Well, that's actually how the virus actually kind of gets in as well. It just kind of sneaks its way down uh, into your airways um, from, the, from your nose all the way down the back of your throat. And once it gets into your air sacs, and this is what the research we've been doing, we've been able to get the lungs from people who actually have passed away from COVID-19. And these are autopsy tissues. So what I'm doing is actually working with a team of pathologists to really try to figure out what's going on. And what we're beginning to find out is that the moment that virus gets into your lungs, not only does it cause inflammation in your lungs, but it invades your blood vessels. And when the blood vessels actually are invaded by this virus, think about a blood vessel um, being lined with blood vessel cells, those cells get filled up with the virus like a gumball machine. Now um, uh, blood starts to get clotty because of the infected uh, blood vessel and your immune system is trying to get rid of uh, the virus and it and it uh, also destroys the blood vessel along the way. And this is why we're beginning to see all these complications occurring um, that you're hearing about the stroke, the COVID toe. Uh, and frankly, this is probably why your lungs go down as well is because it's not getting enough oxygen. So again, this is breaking news on what we're understanding about how COVID infects or impacts our body. But the reason that's important is that what I'm seeing with the research and what we're beginning to learn um, as medical researchers as a whole is that every step of the way from the time that the virus gets into your nose all the way down to the bottom in order to clear the virus to get over this terrible version of the cold we need to actually have a strong immune system so i want to clear up something covid 19 is not an autoimmune disease you don't want a lower immune system you want a strong immune system it's like having a strong lock on your door to prevent somebody from breaking into your house um, and then your immune system is kind of like the german shepherd you have you need plenty you need that that, that uh, dog to be well fed to be able to go after somebody if it gets into your home so let's talk about um, uh, what health would mean in this 
COVID era because this is a lot more than juicing, jogging, and yoga. We really are um, our life and death um, kind of. It's a life and death kind of of, of um, system to really try to make sure our health defenses are shored up and and boosted. So. Um, by the way, if you want to hear more about the health defense systems that can protect you against not only infection but cancer and other diseases, that's all in my book. And so, um, but I'm going to focus on immunity uh, today. So let me talk about the immune system. Um, the immune system. Think about your our, our immune system as an army of super soldiers that um, uh, are in. It's in our body, and like an army of super soldiers, you have the infantry. You've got the generals, you've got the special forces, um, and they all have their own types of weapons to take out um, uh, uh, bad guys and to actually defend uh, our, our homeland. And the homeland is actually the body. And so, what, so again, we talked about the importance of defending ourselves using strong immunity at the front gate. Uh, so what does it take to actually get um, really um, good Im immunity from the front gate? You need to actually be well hydrated because you want that mucous membrane to be there. You want antibodies uh, to be produced. These are regular antibodies. They're not anti-COVID antibodies. They are, these are just what are, are regularly around to actually help tackle um, invaders. And um, uh, so that, that's one type of what we call the innate immunity. It's kind of a knee-jerk reflex, a lock on the door, um, uh, uh, and then if, if somebody tries to break in, um, uh, uh, you've got other uh, parts of the immune cells, other parts of the super soldiers come out um, to try to uh, tackle it and take it down. Now, if you really get into trouble, uh, the immune system can actually fire up and really try to nuke an invader. And that's really where you get this like terrible um, cytokine storm you hear about. It's like when you go into desperate mode and uh, uh, and the whole house is filled with bad guys, then you know you sort of want to use a flash um, a bang grenade in order to try to get rid of everything. That, that inflammation is like a last ditch effort. So we want to make sure we get as far away from that stage as possible, which is why we need strong immunity. So what does it take to make the immune system happy? Well, it turns out that what we eat, our micronutrients, stuff in our food, is really important to keep our immune system happy. Now, uh, I'm just showing you a list here. I'm going to talk about this in a second. But let me just tell you that researchers have shown if you are deficient in vitamin D, vitamin C, uh, zinc, uh, vitamin B12, these are sort of the things that you get from fruits and vegetables regularly. If you're deficient in those things, your immune system is going to be suppressed. If you're sleep deprived, your immune system's depressed. Uh, um, uh, there's lots of, you're too stressed um, uh, from work, from home, from relationships, your immune system is going to be really down. So food happens to be one of the ways to actually support your immunity um, uh, in good times and bad. Now we're kind of in a bad time right now with COVID-19, so we need to at least get to the baseline. And so what are the things that you can do to um, uh, shore up, for example, your vitamin C? Well, it turns out that you know citrus fruits, strawberries, guava, all great sources, broccoli, all great sources of, 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 of vitamin C. Zinc, if you're in, into seafood, um, uh, shellfish are actually a good source of, of, um, uh, of zinc. Uh, and uh, vitamin D, uh, it turns out that mushrooms are actually a really good source of that as well. Um, so the key thing is that if you don't eat a normal, healthy diet, mostly whole foods, fruits and vegetables, lots of legumes, um, you can be malnourished. Your, you, your immune system can be um, malnourished even if you're surrounded by food. This is the one thing that we're beginning to realize kind of separates the people that might have a slightly weakened immune system from people that are uh, have a strong immune system. We don't have all the secrets yet um, uh, uh, deciphered um, uh, to figure out who gets, uh, who can be infected and gets sick uh, from COVID-19 versus who gets infected and doesn't get sick. But we do know that if you have a, if your immune system's down, you might actually be at, at a higher risk to be in trouble. So you got to have those micronutrients. But Here's a couple of things that I wanted to share with you um, that's, uh, that, uh, that I'm pulling right out from my, my book, Eat to Beat Disease. Um, there are certain foods that actually can boost your immune system, make it stronger. So, for example, broccoli sprouts, which, you know, these are the three to four day old broccoli sprouts you can get in a grocery store in the produce section. Um, uh, these uh, 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 sprouts 
um, have the same thing as a grown-up broccoli, uh, which is called um, a natural chemical called sulforaphane that boosts your immune system. And it turns out that the sprouts, these three to four day old sprouts, have 100 times the amount of the immune boosting stuff compared to an adult broccoli. And they, they're kind of not as much work to eat. You can stick these in a smoothie or a shake. And an amazing research um, uh, uh, piece of research was done on humans was they actually took young people, young healthy people who are getting the flu vaccine against the flu virus. Okay, so this is not COVID, but this is the flu. Um, but it actually shows you what this, what broccoli sprouts do. Um, if they got the regular flu um, uh, vaccine, uh, and they, uh, but they also drank um, uh, uh, a couple of cups of uh, broccoli sprout shake a day, they could boost their body's immune system um, up to 30 times more than if they didn't bring drink the shake. So this is actually taking a medicine and making it work even better. So this is not food or medicine, this is food and medicine helping you resist a virus. So broccoli sprouts, you know, is, stand, is a standout. Pomegranate juice, um, uh, one of the, something I drink every day, I love pomegranate juice. Turns out that the um, uh, natural uh, coloring in pomegranate juice, which is a deep ruby rich red, actually is a natural chemical that helps our gut um, secrete healthy mucus. Now, remember we talked about healthy, happy guts. When your gut has a lot of healthy mucus, the bacteria love to grow in it. Think about like, you know, tadpoles uh, in a pond. They're really happy when, they're, when their water is actually nice and deep and rich. This is actually the same thing that pomegranate juice does. The bacteria that have been found to grow when pomegranate, when you drink pomegranate juice is a bacteria called Ackermansia. I read about this in my book. Ackermansia is one of the surveillance super soldiers that helps our immune system stay strong. Not only is it good for you know basic infection, but it also happens to be one of the bacteria that seems to help us resist cancer. Now you know if you've got a part of your immune system that can is strong enough to help you um, uh, spot and eliminate cancer, it's probably going to be good against other invaders, including viruses as well. So pomegranate juice is a great bet. You only actually need to have about eight ounces, which is a cup a day, to do it. Nuts, great source of fiber, walnuts, pecans, macadamias, um, uh, uh, almonds, they all contain dietary fiber that boosts the immune system. Mushrooms uh, have not only have vitamin D, like I mentioned, uh, but they also have a fiber called beta-glucan that helps your mucus actually uh, contain uh, the antibodies, so that frontline defense I told you, the lock on the door to prevent the bad guys from getting in. And by the way, when it comes to vitamin D, if you leave your mushrooms in the sunlight, like on your counter by a window, it turns out that when mushrooms are exposed to the sun, oddly, the levels of vitamin D go up, concentrate. So not only does the mushroom flavor get a little nice and more potent, but you actually wind up having more vitamin D in it as well. Uh, tomatoes, great source of vitamin C for the immune system, one of my favorites. Here's the great news, whether it's a big tomato or a cherry tomato, whether it's tomato sauce, tomato paste, um, uh, any kind of tomato that you have will give you that vitamin C that your immune um, uh, system uh, needs. And then foods for your gut, gut, healthy gut bacteria, we should be talking about things like sauerkraut, fermented foods, kimchi, pickles, kombucha, yogurt, even certain kinds of cheese actually seem to be able to um, uh, deliver um, bacteria that gives healthy gut bacteria. So what kind of cheese are you talking about? Um, for example, Parmigiano Reggiano, the kind that's from Italy, is made with a lactobacillus, a kind of bacteria that's good. It's a probiotic bacteria. So um, the list is so huge that I couldn't possibly talk about them all or show them all, but there's a total list of more than 200 foods in my book, Eat to Be Diseased. So please feel free um, to actually go to the book and you can see the foods that you already love and start from there. My whole um, emphasis, and when I talk to people about foods that, that um, can lead to a healthier lifestyle in the time of COVID, is not to focus on cutting things out of your life, but leaning into your food, finding the foods that are healthy that you already love and focusing on those things so that every time you go to the grocery store, you're not sitting there scratching your head wondering what you should buy, but you know what you should get. You should get the stuff you like to eat. You should try to um, uh, 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 load up on that. Uh, go to the produce section, fresh fruits and vegetables, um, uh, go to the middle of the aisle and you can get things like olive oil and nuts and beans. Those are all good for your gut. Um, and every day we have three chances um, to 
basically practice food as medicine, we get to write our own prescriptions to ourselves as kitchen doctors of what we're actually going to put into our bodies to boost our uh, immunity. So um, let me just uh, uh, sort of say that when it comes to um, uh, foods that are really great for you, the rules really haven't changed that much. Eat um, plant-based foods, um, uh, cut down on uh, red meat, cut down or cut out on red meats. Uh, ultra processed foods are not good for your health. So the things in the boxes, look, if we were in the 1950s and this were, um, uh, we were having a pandemic, we'd go, everybody would go rushing for the frozen TV dinners and you know the things that are in boxes like Pop-Tarts and everything else. Um, we're, this is 2021, we know a lot better. We should be eating fresh whole foods. The food is safe, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, but you gotta sort of um, uh, watch out for the stuff that you already know that's not good for you. Focus on the stuff um, that is good for you. And there's a couple of other things that I think that's important to cut out. Um, uh, you know, uh, Try to cut out or cut down on stress, as hard as that is, um, regular breathing, uh, staying physically active. If you can't work out at the gym, go for a walk, even a 30 minute walk around the block actually gets your blood going. Um, by the way, it helps your stem cells come out so you're regenerating from the inside out. Um, your gut microbiome, a healthy gut bacteria likes it, so therefore your immune system likes it. We're beginning to understand why exercise is good for you. Um, uh, so those are all things that you can do. You can um, lower stress by talking to friends, you know, watching um, uh, shows and movies that are actually make you laugh and smile. It's really important to try to um, uh, 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 lower your stress levels, even as we actually are um, in this uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, phase. A couple of other things, uh, I know there's a polling question coming up, but a couple of other things I wanted to make sure that you're cautious. When you're going out, a healthy lifestyle is going to mean going forward, you know, that you're wearing a mask um, in public, for as long as we can see, please don't be one of those people that are not wearing a mask. We don't know yet enough about this uh, about this virus, and believe me, I'm one of the people working on it. You want to protect your nose and your mucous membranes from having that virus get into you. And yes, a mask does help block things a bit. Um, if you've got gloves when you're going out shopping in the grocery store, please wear those. Hand sanitizers. By the way, besides sanitizing your ungloved hands, when you're wearing gloves, if you have some of the hand sanitizer, Purell, whatever it is, you can even wash your gloves to kill off the bacteria. It only takes 60 seconds uh, to do that. If you get mail um, uh, delivered to your house, um, if you let it sit out, cardboard tends to, um, uh, uh, the virus can sit on cardboard, it'll die in 24 hours. So if you don't get your mail every day or don't open a box every day um, uh, and you just let it sit out, by the next day, you should be fine. Um, you want to clean as much as possible and try not to touch too much um, stuff um, uh, when you're out in the store. Use a credit card. Don't use cash if you can avoid it because it um, turns out the virus can, can stay on the money uh, for a long time. Um, and then when and when we talked about food, I want to just kind of wind up on one sort of safe thing that you can do, because um, I, I wondered about this too, you know, when I was bringing uh, groceries back from my house, what do you do? Well, you kind of bring it to your house and you have kind of a clean area and a dirty area. Your, your, um, uh, the dirty area is where the food comes right into the house and you, you kind of want to use like a, 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 a wipe. Um, something uh, that has a little bit of Lysol detergent wipe, um, uh, Purell wipe, something just to wipe down the boxes, um, uh, make sure you're wearing your mask and the gloves. And then for food, fresh food, you don't want to actually put uh, any kind of detergent, any kind of chemical on the food any, and, and fresh food. Those things stick in the sink and rinse them for 30 seconds. The things that you can rinse, apples, oranges, fruits, things that you know, if you rinse them off for 60 seconds in cool running water and then, then just let them out and dry or dry them up with a the towel, then put them away. Things that you can't wash, that you don't wanna wash, like onions and garlic and stuff like that, you know what, sit them out on the counter and, and don't touch them for about a day or so and you'll be fine. Um, uh, and you should probably wash them before you're actually cooking with them. So. These are sort of really things that uh, how I've changed my life as somebody that number one really enjoys food. Um, I'm, you know, I, I I love to explore foods, cook foods. I think that people should relate to their culture. So, you know, um, look to what kind of things make you feel um, homey, uh, comfort food, things like that. Uh, look for the healthy components of it and go for those. Um, but do try to actually uh, take great care uh, in. Um, 
uh, in in uh, navigating around the world until we get on top of this virus we still have to be extra careful so now I'm actually going to turn it back to Amy for the polling question uh, and, um, uh, and and see uh, how you guys uh, think about the third question Amy? Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Like he mentioned, um, we do have another polling question for you all. Um, as I mentioned before, these responses are anonymous while in the call, so don't worry about sharing your opinion. And this question has to do with what worries you the most about reopening the country. Um, you can choose as many or as few as these options as you'd like. So maybe you're worried about catching the virus. Maybe uh, you want to know more about going out in public safely or you know, you just want to get as much information as possible. So please select uh, what you think applies best to you. You can choose more than one. Um, but as we get these answers in, I do just want to remind everybody that the slides will be available from pgrfsi.com and a recording, including the full Q&A session that we're going to have in a few slides here, um, that recording will be made available through the PGRFSI YouTube channel. And I'll have more information about how to find that at the end of the presentation. So it looks like we've got a good number of responding. So let me go ahead and close the poll. And here's what you all thought about it. I mean, honestly, there is no wrong answer, obviously. Um, everybody has different concerns and all of them are equally valid. So now that we've got that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back to Dr. Lee to talk about easing fears about coronavirus. Right, so here's one of the things that uh, we're gonna be uh, um, moving forward into a world where the restrictions that we've been all operating under um, are, are going to be lifted. And that, that's, a, that's a, going to be a, um, a, a, a big, we're all going to breathe this, uh, uh, breathe relief, a sigh of relief when that actually happens. Uh, one of the things that I was mentioning earlier, it's so important to do is to continue to wear a mask when you go out um, if you, and, and to be able to be really conscious of physical distancing from the other. It's not social distancing. I don't like to use that word because it really is about, it's not about trying to break the social connection we have with people, but it's just about being careful about the distance you are with other people. If you're afraid of actually um, catching the virus and you want to make sure you're safe when you go out, try to maintain your space with other people. Remember when we were kids, we were always told, make sure you maintain a respectful space with with, our, with the person next to you, this is a great um, uh, time to remember that we uh, have to do that as adults. So don't get into a situation where you're, um, you know, in a crowd and everybody's uh, 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 jumbling around you. That's not a safe place um, uh, to be. Hand washing is probably one of the most important things you can do. And um, I, I created a, a video on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, you can find uh, under Dr. William Lee um, uh, uh, on how to wash your hands. And although they said happy birthday, I gotta, I gotta kind of admit something to you guys. When, when, I go to, when doctors go to medical school, we are taught how to wash our hands to be clean enough that we can actually go into surgery. That's kind of the standard you want to go to. It takes about two minutes to wash your hand that way. And you'll see in the video how I do it. But I'll just tell you, soap it up, wash, you know, wring your hands back and forth and back and forth. You want to clean your fingers and your fingertips. And you want to actually literally squeegee out every single finger um, with one hand, sque you squeeze out all the other fingers, and then, and then continue to rinse. By the time you do that, you have sung happy birthday more than twice. It's about two minutes, and you'll be amazed at how much stuff comes off your hand. Please continue to do that. Honestly, that's actually probably something we should have been doing anyway. Now is a great way to actually do that, and we'll probably get sick less from other uh, 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 diseases as well. Um, hand sanitizer, you want to get 70% alcohol or more. That, by the way, that percent of alcohol kills a virus pretty quickly on surfaces, like in about a minute. So you can, if you if you got contaminated, uh, for example, by accidentally touching something um, that might have been infected, you know, if you put on enough Purell and, and wipe it around. Um, really good for about a minute, it'll be gone no matter what. So uh, the virus is pretty fragile. Um, so I think that helps us ease our fear by staying clean, trying to get rid of it. Uh, I talked about how to um, uh, wipe down your groceries, your boxes and cans and things, and then just kind of rinse off um, your fresh food and then stick it away. That's really the best um, way uh, to do this. When are we gonna be safe? When are we gonna be able to get back to our lives? Really, honestly, uh, it, it'll be uh, closer to returning to where we were uh, in terms of our mindset when we have a vaccine. People are working on that. It's going to take while, a while. When there's a medicine that can effectively treat this, 
um, we'll also be a lot more comfortable. I can tell you the medical community will be a lot more comfortable because we'll know what to give people. The most recent information about the medicines that look like they have an effect are all intravenous medicines. So I wouldn't put too much stock that though you know that 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 that's the Calvary saving the day. We are looking for we need pills and things that can actually that people can take at home. Um, uh, but so research is still underway uh, uh, for that. And then you know honestly, I think that when the numbers go down, like the one, it, it it's it's a it kind of stinks to actually take a look at all these numbers going up every single day. But here's the good news. One day soon, hopefully, those numbers will start plummeting down. And that's just the nature of these pandemics. So go up, numbers go up, people react, society reacts, the numbers will go down. When those numbers start plunging down to low levels, where we're not get, seeing many cases, by the way, um, New Zealand is almost down to zero. Australia is way down. Um, Italy, uh, which really suffered badly, the cases are also down. So it is possible to actually lower these cases. When the cases go down, we're, we're gonna start feeling more um, genuinely relaxed because the virus isn't just isn't around um, as much anymore, less chance of actually getting it. So I, I know like you guys, I too have a lot of anxiety and, and had more fear at the beginning about coronavirus, COVID-19, what's going on? What do I need to do? How do I stay safe? How do we keep my family safe? What I can tell you is that knowledge is power. Understanding how this disease works, understanding it goes through the nose, it goes down to your lungs, it attacks your blood vessels. Those things actually start putting the power in our hands because we now know we need to ramp up our immune system, get the gate short up, make sure that we're not actually breathing it in, um, uh, you know, feeding our bodies the right way so that our defenses are really strong. And then just, you know, uh, having good common, modern common sense, uh, given the pandemic to, to navigate around, uh, keep face, uh, safe physical distancing um, and, and, and try to uh, use this time to take a pause and and ask yourself what really matters and what really matters are people our relationships um, the things that uh, uh, the things that we really care about start to become uh, really uh, uh, clear uh, when we actually think about uh, things like that so uh, what I would tell you is that uh, it's not time to let down our guard However, it is time to start easing our fears. And one of the most important things you can do is you can actually make a decision every time you go into the kitchen, every time you go to the supermarket, um, that you're gonna decide that you're gonna do something to eat to beat disease. And the disease is not only the chronic diseases, but today we wanna be able to also um, uh, uh, have the best chance of actually not getting sick from COVID-19. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much again, Dr. Lee. Um, here are some ways you can reach Dr. Lee. Um, he's on all of the social media channels and he has his own website as well, drwilliamlee.com. And there's his handle. We have some more uh, contact information for Dr. Lee on the Q&A slide. So let's move on along there. We have one final polling question for you all today. And that one is, uh, what do you want to learn more about from today's presentation? And you can choose as many or as few of these as you'd like. Again, um, do you want to learn more about boosting your immune system or, you know, more tips on how to stay safe as things start to reopen, you know, more facts and figures to ease your fears about the, the virus? Or maybe you want a little bit of everything. Um, so please go ahead and fire off those responses. Um, and as I mentioned before, we are going to take as many questions as we can. Um, I know we have a ton of questions coming in, so just go ahead and put those in there and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, down on that questions tab, uh, just type it in and hit enter and we should be able to see it. Um, so we'll just let a few more answers come in on this. And it looks like we, we piqued your curiosity a little bit about boosting the immune system. So that is great to see. And I'm sure um, Dr. Lee will have more resources available if you reach out. So for a quick second before we get to q and I'm going to let uh, Paul really quickly talk about uh, the other upcoming webinars that we have uh, with PGRFSI. So Paul, did you want to say something about your uh, schedule of webinars? Yeah, yeah, sure. That That's good. Thank you, Amy. And, and th thank you, uh, Dr. Lee. That was an amazing presentation. These are, I won't take a lot of time. These are just a few of our upcoming webinars that we have. Some are with uh, recognized groups like Michigan State University. Others are with the various uh, scheme owners on the uh, global food safety side, um, such as FSSC and Primus. 
we're really still in the COVID mode right now, trying to um, provide you with as much information to prepare yourselves and your business and how to manage a crisis really in these times from a certification and registration perspective. So one of the things we work very closely with our scheme owners like FSSC and Primus, um, because every one of them, it, when we're having to make so many adjustments to our business and manage our customers' expectations, it's also important for our customers in our, uh, our group of contacts to understand what the actual scheme owners are doing um, to manage the crisis as well, because a lot of the people that we work with want to know that. So that's it. Uh, just please, you know, log on to uh, pjrfsi.com slash webinars. And we're going to have a full slate of webinars that are going to continue to happen all throughout the year. So thank you uh, on behalf of our company uh, for joining. And I look forward to answering your questions. Great. Thanks so much, Paul. And now your, most, your much anticipated favorite part of the webinar, I'm sure, our Q&A session. So like I said, Please go ahead and drop those questions right in the questions tab, but I will get started with a question for uh, Dr. Lee. This is from Brian. Brian says, I'm a owner of a small family grocery store. Do you have any recommendations for retailers during this time um, to give confidence to our consumers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that one of the things that retailers can really do is to take a look at what they're offering to their uh, consumers um, and identify the most healthy things. You know, I think that uh, we all go to our favorite stores or the stores we're really used to. But one thing that I, I know that I really appreciate when I go to a store is if I have a little extra help from uh, the retailer to point out something that I might actually want. So, for example, if you're selling um, foods, um, uh, I'd be happy to work with you to actually figure out what foods actually um, might be um, super healthy in these COVID times. And, and putting a little arrow or putting a little star, you know, helping to point people in that direction is really great. Um, I, I really I'm trying to find a positive way to actually deal with this. There, there's obviously there are things like the plexiglass and the aisles and, and the tape on the floor six feet apart. I mean, I think that there are lots of uh, rules and regulations that are going to come up from the government. But I think one of the things that I could um, from, from the topic of today's conversation is really help your consumer, help your customer customer find the best stuff for them you know if you've got tomatoes or if you've got canned tomatoes that's fantastic to be able to offer them if you've got cleaning supplies um, uh, wipes tell them where they are like you know help them make that beeline because they probably don't want to spend a ton of time in your store you want to help them use their time as efficiently as possible all right, perfect. It uh, looks like we've got another question that's come in from Jeffrey. Jeffrey asks for some clarification on the alcohol issue in sanitization. Um, he says, you mentioned 70% alcohol. Is that with regard to ethanol or isopropyl? I read that the CDC recommends 70% isopropyl or 60% ethanol. Right. Well, isopropyl alcohol is at 70% and it is 70% ethanol. Uh, I think that there are, and, and you know, like uh, PJR FSI is perfect to ask for, you know, as you go forward, what the standards for safety are going to be in the commercial setting, what type of cleaning uh, should be going on. I, I know that I was asked um, similar questions by somebody working in the air in the aircraft uh, business sort of saying like, well, what would be the, uh, uh, what what type of standards should be done to clean an aircraft? Because you remember like the tray, the, the tray tables are not the cleanest place, actually one of the dirtiest places. Um, uh, but I would say as, you know, from a consumer level, um, most of the, um, uh, m most of the, uh, uh, the hand sanitizers have the, Hello. Hi, Dr. Lee. Can hear you now. Uh, sorry, did did uh, I, I don't know if I uh, cut out in mid sentence or did you guys hear what I was saying about um, the most most commercial hand sanitizers actually have the requisite amount of alcohol. That, yeah, yeah great. I think that was the where it cut off was when you first started talking about uh, commercial hand sanitizers. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I was just saying that. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, now. 
Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, most of the commercial hand sanitizers have the requisite amount of 70% alcohol, but yeah, I think that standard um, organizations are going to be disseminating whatever the federal standards are going to be or the state standards really keeping businesses clean, and that's going to be something that's going to be really important to pay attention to. So that's a, a PGRFSI question. All right, uh, we've got a question here from Cindy. Cindy asks, uh, do stomach acids kill the virus? The answer, the quick answer to that is yes. Uh, our stomach acid is an amazing uh, part of our uh, uh, immune defenses, actually, because it dissolves pretty much any living thing that gets kind of gets in there. Um, but don't forget, to get to your stomach, to get to that acid, it's got to traverse all the airways, all the mucous membranes, um, and it can get pretty close um, to your airways to get into your lungs. So I, I would say that the, the uh, uh, the stomach acid is pretty good. And what's interesting uh, to, about that question is that we're beginning to al also find that um, uh, that the, that's the virus can also get into the gut. So we're not 100% sure exactly um, uh, how much stomach acid or whether you have, you know, like the, if the if the virus can actually escape it, if you actually are, if it comes in with food or how it actually gets protected. But stomach acid in general, like pretty much wipes out any virus. I mean, that's just, we've known that for years. Um, uh, it's also possible, by the way, that that to get into our gut, there are other ways that the virus can, you know, um, uh, transfer in there besides swallowing uh, the virus. Maybe it crawls in there through the blood vessel system uh, from kind of behind the scenes, uh, behind the counter to get back into our gut. All right, great. Uh, we have a question from Eileen. Uh, what's your take on all the fad diets out there? Is there anything that you recommend to uh, use or avoid? Right. Okay. So one thing that everybody should know is that uh, I'm a believer in health, not uh, set diets, because there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all diet for every for everyone. And when it comes to um, our health defense systems. Number one, everybody is a little bit different. We, we know that. And so, again, there's no set pattern that's actually going to have set protocol that's going to be um, a good for you. Uh, think about your own defenses. Think about how do you actually make your circulation uh, work well? How do you get your uh, stem cells to work well? How do we get our health, gut, good gut health? It's not simple, but it's re it, it, it's not a simple uh, thing to actually go for, which is why there isn't one protocol that, that goes for it. But I would tell you a couple of things. Um, uh, diets that stress healthy eating, including Mediterranean diets or Asian diets, uh, cut down on your saturated fats, cut down on your meats, um, uh, and cut down on your, uh, or eliminate ultra-processed foods. Those are all um, general patterns of diets that will help you no matter what. So if you happen to be on a very particular diet and it's working for you, I would say stick with it. But when it comes to your immune system, really, you know, sort of all these defenses are interconnected together. Everyone's going to be different. Everyone's going to like different foods. And what I like, you know, I, I, I call my system of health, the mixed martial arts way of being healthy. So it's not one style you have to use. Um, you can actually use any style that actually helps your health defenses. And uh, and that's really what I emphasize in my book, Eat to Beat Disease. All right, perfect. We've got a question now from Lori. Lori asks, would using a neti pot or gargling with salt water help stop the virus? Uh, you know what? A neti pot actually is just good for flushing. Um, uh, and uh, it's probably just good for general nose sanitation, uh, but but uh, that's not a virus stopper. I think the key thing is all these other safety uh, exposure things that we're talking about. Um, but you know, if you feel uh, you need to kind of uh, clean out your nose, a neti pot actually uh, can be a helpful, helpful thing, but it's not something specifically for um, COVID-19. All right, great. And just a quick general reminder, I see a lot of questions coming in regarding whether there will be a recording or the slides available, and the answer to both is yes. Um, you'll be able to find the recording, including this Q&A session, on the PGRFSI YouTube channel. If you just search um, Perry Johnson Registrar's Food Safety or PGRFSI, you should be able to find the channel pretty easily. Um, let's see, we've got a question now from Tina. Tina asks, my mother has cancer. What kind of advice should I give her on what she should be doing or eating to protect herself? Ooh, okay, so first of all, sorry to hear about your mother. That's um, difficult because right now, one of the most important things I think is for, your, for someone 
who has cancer is to make sure they're staying in close touch with their oncologist for, in order to be able to follow the directions of what the oncologist uh, needs to do. So you don't want to actually avoid treatments. You want to make sure you follow up and, and get the guidance of your oncologist. Um, the second thing is that what can you do for yourself at home? You know, lowering stress is super important because high stress actually provokes cancer to grow faster. So trying to do things that lower stress is important. Eating to beat cancer is what I gave my TED talk on. Um, and there are lots of foods that you can actually um, uh, eat to actually help um, combat cancer by upping your defenses. And if you strengthen your immunity, which is good for COVID-19, it's also good to help your immune system find and wipe out cancer. If you're actually improving your circulation, that um, it will actually have bring good blood flow to your healthy organs, but it can also cut off the blood supply uh, to, to cancers. Um, uh, green tea, for example, is one of those um, substances that I talk about in my TED Talk. Really, really powerful way of actually cutting off, starving a cancer by cutting off its blood supply. Oh, by the way, green tea also lowers inflammation, which is a good thing um, if you are infected with a virus. So you see, um, this is why I think that Let's think about our defenses. Let's think about what we're trying to do. There's no magic formula. Uh, when, when you're dealing with cancer, though, what, you're, what you need to realize is that better than chemotherapy uh, is actually what your body can do by itself. And what we're finding with immune therapies for cancer is that uh, if, you, if, if you play your cards right and, and, and help your immune system find the cancer, uh, even in an elder person, it's possible that an older person's immune system uh, is strong enough to be able to wipe cancer out altogether. So that's something that you know I encourage every cancer patient is to talk to your, uh, your oncologist, um, don't skip appointments, figure out how to stay on top of your treatments, and definitely ask about immune therapies for cancer. Because just like we need a strong immune uh, system against COVID-19, we need an even stronger system to uh, prevent and fight cancer. Great. And a similar question to that vein, um, are there any precautions you recommend for going to doctor's offices for other routine appointments and treatments in this time? Yeah, so um, many doctor's offices uh, were closed until a few weeks ago, until about a week ago, because uh, they were non-essential. Most of the doctors were directed um, to uh, work in the intensive care unit or the emergency room. Now, the system is opening back up, and we know that we need to be able to take care of people that have all these other ailments that, that, that everybody had before COVID-19. Um, what I would say, the first, uh, you know, and, and every hospital it has its own protocols. Um, what I would say, before you go to your doctor's office to follow up an appointment, give that office a call, ask them what their protocol for safety is, um, uh, ask them about masks, ask them about gloves, ask them about how their waiting room is set up and where you should go to sit, um, ask them how long you have to be there, um, and if there are any COVID-19 precautions uh, that, that need to be taken. Uh, most likely, they're probably going to ask you back, you know, um, have you had a fever? Have you had a cough? Um, uh, uh, or anything like that. Uh, and, and that's a good conversation to be having. So I would say, before you go to the doctor's office, call up, uh, call up the office and ask them about the precautions. Be prepared to wear, uh, wear a mask, maybe bring gloves to be extra safe. Um, uh, but do not actually, and you want to keep your physical distance in the office as well, um, but do not avoid those doctor's visits. They can be really, really important to make sure that you get the treatments you need. Perfect. Um, we have a question now from Laura. Uh, Laura asks, what have you seen with regards to children, um, if anything, as far as safety during the virus? Are there any recommendations for children? Right. Okay. So let's let's think about children, first of all, um, uh, in general, have not been major victims of COVID-19. That said, we're beginning to now see that children can be carriers of the virus, which means that they can bring it home, they can spread it to the adults or the grandparents. And um, just recently, within the last week or so, there have been some reports that children have these odd blood vessel inflammatory conditions that are that seem to be associated with virus infection. They test positive um, as well. And so one of the things that I think is is this is all kind of new. We used to think it was just you know um, much older people and people who had chronic diseases. Now we realize that like everybody um, can be susceptible. Uh, so for kids, 
what I would say, teach them to wash their hands, help them wash their hands if they're young, wash them really, really well, set an example, now's the time to learn. Um, uh, teach them not to touch their face, because that's actually how um, they could transfer um, some a virus from a dirty surface um, uh, to their mucous membranes by touching their face. We all touch our face all the time. One of the things that they said in the beginning, which is true, is that by wearing a mask, you're not touching your face quite as much. Um, most children don't really like wearing a mask. However, I think if you, um, depending on the age of your child, uh, uh, there's, uh, if you actually let them know that it's kind of like a, kind of like a game, they can go outside with all the grown-ups and everybody's wearing a mask. It's kind of like Halloween. Um, uh, it, it's important that they try to wear a mask um, when they're uh, when they're out and about uh, as well. And then I think the other thing that I would tell you is super important because parents are setting examples for their kids. And they're providing for their kids, especially when it comes to food, feed your kids immune supporting foods. The ones that we, same ones we talked about, find ways to make that tasty. All right, great. Now we've got a, a really great question from Norman. Um, what is the best healthy way to cook essential vegetables? And there's also a similar question from Jessica regarding, um, is it better to eat fruit whole or juiced? Ah. Okay, hands. So let's see. Let's let's start with how do you cook uh, fresh vegetables? You know, uh, I kind of say the old ways are sometimes the best ways. Um, uh, after you really, really thoroughly wash fresh vegetables, which you should wash at least 60 seconds under running water and then dry them off. Um, in this day and age, you might want to peel the vegetables a little bit if they've got a thick skin on them, um, just to just to be extra safe. You don't have to, but that's a that's a precaution I take. And what I do is um, if you steam. Um, uh, you steam until they turn, if it's green, to really bright green, then you stop. If you're going to saute, um, slice them up and put them in a pan until they turn really, uh, the color turns intense, uh, as like when you know uh, that, that they're, they're done. Um, don't overcook. Don't boil vegetables. Uh, that's actually, unless you're going to make a soup, boiling is the surest way uh, to, uh, to, to um, destroy some of the good stuff. Uh, um, now the question was about, um, about oh, by the way, one thing about cooking with fresh vegetables, combine things together. Combine some garlic uh, uh, with your uh, uh, with your with your veggies, or you know, uh, add some tomatoes to it. You, there's all kinds of things you can do. Saute. The internet is wonderful because you can actually pick a couple of ingredients. Let's say tomato, broccoli, garlic. You can just type those into YouTube, and you will find um, uh, demonstrations of how to put those things together and give you lots of ideas. I know children are also doing that um, as well. As a far as opposed to eating whole fruit or juice. Here's what I would say. Um, a variation is sort of like the spice of life. Um, if you like juice, you should go for the juice. If you like the whole fruit, um, the advantage of the whole fruit is that you actually get a lot of the fiber. And the fiber of the fruit, actually, it, it, what, what your body doesn't absorb feeds your microbiome, your gut bacteria, which is then good for immunity. So I, in general, like to eat um, whole fresh fruit. Um, but every now and then, you know, I, I enjoy a cup of juice. Uh, and, and obviously, if you're going to make a smoothie or something, um, you're going to use some use use things to juice as well. Pomegranate is one of the examples I talked about earlier. That should be juice because it's too difficult to really, really get a lot of juice out of the seeds, and you can't really eat as much. It's hard to eat a lot of the seeds. Or you can pour yourself a glass of pomegranate juice. All right, we've got a question now from Susan. Susan asks, uh, would it help the mucous membranes to use a humidifier? Absolutely. Humidity, humidity um, uh, is really, really important because when you're really dry, your mucus dries up, uh, which means that the protective antibodies and things like that are not working as well. Your nose can crack. You know, you can get scabby inside your nose. Uh, it, you know, that that just makes it easier for bacteria and viruses to kind of invade. So if your house is really, really dry, a humidifier can be really useful. Um, uh, but you know, you're not you're not making bread in the house. You don't need to actually you know, make it into a, uh, it, it doesn't have to be dripping from the ceiling. Uh, I would say just get good, comfortable humidity um, is, uh, is a good idea. Humidifier is a great idea. Keep, keep it clean though. All right, we've got a question from Angela. Um, is hydrogen peroxide also an effective disinfectant? 
Yeah, so hydrogen peroxide is happens to be another virus killing uh, 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 um, uh, liquid, uh, and you know, and, and we we use it actually, uh, you know, kind of first aid at home. You get a cut, you pour hydrogen peroxide, kind of kills bacteria around it. Um, it it's also a disinfectant. What what you should be careful about hydrogen peroxide though is that um, you can actually um, damage and discolor some surfaces. With, so it, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about your hands. Um, the best thing is soap, honestly. Um, uh, good, a good soap and water, best way to actually get rid of um, any chance of getting a virus on. Um, hand sanitizer, if you're not near running water, that's actually good. If you're cleaning surfaces, um, you know, a variety of different cleaners, I would go to the CDC website. Um, uh, they actually have, uh, uh, and some other websites um, you can look up uh, from the government will actually have a list of the of the cleaning agents um, that actually uh, have been shown to kill COVID. I think Lysol actually has um, bleach um, uh, as well. Uh, you know, the the ethanol, 60% um, ethanol, 70% isopropyl alcohol. There's a big long list. Here's the one thing I want to tell you as a doctor though, do not use solvents inside your body and do not expose your food to those types of detergent or household chemicals. All right. In a similar vein, um, Patrice asks, I can't find wipes anywhere. What should I use to clean my groceries? Hmm. Okay. Well, uh, uh, so first of all, for the fresh groceries, uh, fruits and vegetables, water is the best thing. That's going to solve half of your problems. And hopefully that's, you're buying a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, uh, for boxes, uh, um, you know, wipes are hard to find. Um, I would say keep looking for the wipes because that's actually really, really important. Um, I, I suppose if you actually um, could find hydrogen peroxide, like a like a first aid spray, uh, you could probably spray some on a um, on a kitchen towel and use that to wipe down the side of a box or or a can. So you know, we've got to be kind of creative. So this is like Robin Robinson Caruso on the desert island, right? If you um, can't find something, you got to take a look around and see what you have and MacGyver your way out of it. All right, um, we're going to start wrapping up questions. So if anybody has urgent questions um, that they haven't had answered yet, please don't hesitate to reach out to um, any of the contact info on the screen here. Um, obviously, any question is, you know, a great question. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, I was just wondering if our presenters had any final words before we wrap things up for the day. Dr. Lee? Well, first of all, I, I so appreciate um, uh, PJRFSI for giving this opportunity to speak to um, uh, your community. Uh, I really want to be able to partner with um, such excellent groups like PGRFSI to be able to help out. I know there's more questions that came in than I have time to answer. Um, uh, I will ask Amy you to collect all these questions and I will work with my team to provide answers to them and I'll stick them onto my website. Um, so if everybody wants to actually just you know keep firing questions in, we'll, we'll, we'll put them up um, uh, and uh, that way we can, uh, you know, as you said, there's no uh, bad questions. There's only good questions. We'll actually try to, um, uh, I'll try to find a way to address them all. Great. Thanks. And Paul, did you have anything to add? I mean, it, just, just again, a, a special thank you to uh, Dr. Lee and, uh, you know, everybody that spent the time here. As uh, Dr. Lee mentioned, we will collect all of the questions and we will work to provide answers for you. So um, I think in about probably 24 hours, Amy, all of the information will be up on our website. Please feel free to reach out to uh, either myself or, or Dr. Lee at any point. And again, thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you both so much for your time to present. And thank you, everyone who took the time to uh, attend, and especially those who asked questions. Like I said before, we absolutely want to take your questions. We know this can be a, a difficult and stressful time. So we really want to absolutely offer you as much help and clarification as possible. Um, as Paul mentioned, the recording and the slides will be up on the Peter FSI website and our YouTube channel, ready for you to review if you, you know, maybe you came in late or you had to step away for a moment. Um, that that will be completely free of charge available to you. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all again for your time. Um, stay safe and stay healthy out there. Thank you so much for coming.